Good morning, maggots. Today, Esoteric the Free and I are going to go over Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals. How well does the left wing follow the rules? And for the rules they do follow, how much good does it do them? Napoleon once said to not interrupt your enemies when they make fatal mistakes, but since we know that leftists lack the maturity or humility to accept advice from their opponents, what the heck? Let's get into this. Rule number one. Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Marxist groups are incredibly incompetent when it comes to this, which really should show you the absolute state of their ideological movements when Saul Alinsky's work used to be like a holy doctrine to these organizers and came into existence because they needed a doctrine to organize under. Now they fall at the first hurdle. The reason why the ideological left is so poor at this one is because many of them demonstrably don't even understand what their own ideas advocate for. A great example would be how Marx Marxists like to attribute central banking to the so-called capitalist system, while the fifth plank of the Communist Manifesto states that a communist society requires the establishment of a central bank. Or how many Marxists think that social democracy is a tool to achieve communism, while Marx himself argued that social democracy was an extension of bourgeois society in his criticism against the Social Democrat Party of Germany's Gotha program. They don't even know what their own ideas require and entail, and therefore they're incapable of manipulating the public's view of their ideas and the expectations of their intellectual prowess. In order to even attempt to control what the public thinks of you and your ideas, you need to be able to understand them as to have a firm grasp of what your ideas entail. And the irony is that by attempting to follow some of the later rules on this list, particularly Rule 9 and Rule 8, Marxists end up making it much easier for opponents to defeat them on the public stage, and why, in my opinion, Alinsky's rules for radicals are kind of fucking stupid. Because Marxists resort to constantly demonizing their opponents and trying to redefine their beliefs in order to strawman them according to Rules 8 and Rules 9, opponents to Marxism can easily play by Rule 1 and can't be defeated by them because they can't easily argue against their actual beliefs. If the Marxists do acknowledge their actual beliefs and try and argue against them, they would have to admit that they're lying to people in the process, which I suppose a rule Mr. Alinsky would have added if this was even a remotely competent set of ideas was, don't get caught lying. Most, if not all, people that I've ever spoken to who are anarchists now found anarchy after becoming disenfranchised with the state, which they were led to through a glaring inconsistency with one or more of their previously held statist ideals, which they simply couldn't get over. Rule number two. Never go outside the expertise of your people. How well do leftists follow rules two and three? It can be summed up in a single phrase. Rule number three. Whenever possible, go outside the expertise of the enemy. RT if you wish to enlist in the memoir against hate and misinformation from the alt-right. And that's how you know you fucked up. So now we back in Norway. That's how we know we fucked up. <laughs> hey, that's how we know we fucked up. Oh no, that's how we know we fucked up. Hey, that's how we know we fucked up. Fucked up. Uh, fucked up. Yeah. Oh. 
You know, a big part of being able to meme is having relatability. The main reason why the ideological left is incapable of memeing, aside from their painful lack of self-awareness, is that their ideas don't come anywhere near reflecting observable reality or the commonly held beliefs of the average person. This is why their attempts at memeing never catch on outside of their own circles. Rule number four. Make the anime live up to its own book of rules. Even though the left hardly does this at all, the right wing is exceptionally good at this. While the concept of hypocrisy is completely meaningless to the average leftist, as they do not care about being consistent in their beliefs or in practicing what they preach, it does a world of good to point these inconsistencies out to those that would have otherwise been swayed by their rhetoric. For instance, whenever a left-winger, moral fags about caring for the poor or downtrodden, point out statistics that show that right-wingers give more to charity than left-wingers do, and point out the hypocrisy behind being charitable or altruistic with other people's money. Another example would be for every single time a leftist accuses the right of being violent. Just point out all the violent acts carried out by the left, and how their own ideology is inherently violent because it involves the forceful confiscation of private property and dehumanizing any group of people who is genu generally more successful than others. Every single time a leftist accuses their opponents of being racist, you can not only point out all the times they said racist things against white people, but you can also point out their racism of lower expectations torn towards brown people as well. And you can even quote the hateful things that leftist idols like Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Che Guevara, and Margaret Sanger have said. Whenever a leftist makes the claim that hate speech should be censored, or that First Amendment rights of certain political groups should be infringed upon, point out the obvious fact by, that by their own standard, communists and SJWs should also be deplatformed, censored, assaulted on the streets, disenfranchised, or treated like criminals because their ideology is every bit as violent and hateful as fascism and national socialism. You get the idea. Rule number five. Red cool is man's most potent weapon. While the vast majority of leftists have no real sense of humor, now and then you get a few leftists who actually do make attempts to follow this rule, especially the YouTube channel The Birds and the BS, or 8chan communities like Lefty Poll. They do attempt to mock the other side, or to make jokes about their political opponents, or shitposting. Unfortunately, it all falls flat. It simply doesn't resonate with people. Ever heard the phrase, it's funny because it's true? Such a phrase cannot possibly be said for whenever a leftist attempts to make a joke or a meme. Few things are more infuriating than watching someone try to mock someone else for a trait they themselves have. Or to others, it may be hilarious in a way that the person making the joke never intended. If mockery and humor can be used as a means to destroy your political opponents, it's bad enough when your jokes fall flat and when your memes don't get very far, but it's nothing short of disastrous when it backfires on you. Another problem with this for them is that it's far easier to mock them for their lack of ideological consistency, and what absolute fucking spurg lords most of them make themselves out to be. And it doesn't help matters that Marxists inherently construct sacred cows that people are not allowed to question or be critical of in what they claim is to protect the interest of quote-unquote marginalized identities. Meaning that literally everyone knows that there are specific buttons you can press with these people that will cause them to freak out, which only results in more people gathering to make fun of them. Rule number six. A good tactic is one your people enjoy. 
I think this one goes without saying. Marxists are some of the most vitriolic, spiteful, and downright nasty people you'll ever run into. These people definitely don't enjoy their politics, and only ever enter the ideological arena because of the idea of class consciousness and to try and do damage control whenever their bullshit gets called out by their ideological opponents. Unless, of course, you enjoy being a miserable, covetous piece of shit who blames his every misfortune on those who are more successful than himself. Unfortunately for the communists, most people don't. Rule number seven. A tactic that goes on too long becomes the drag. Oh boy. If there is any reason why the NPC meme is a thing, it's because of their utter failure to follow rule seven. The left, for the most part, cannot seem to realize that it has to completely change their game plan. Even when it's apparent that they are losing, they stick to their old strategies. Accusing someone of racism, sexism, homophobia, or of supporting authoritarianism used to carry weight, but not anymore, because it doesn't take a whole lot for an SJW to accuse you of any of those things. Those words have lost the weight they used to carry, and thus, like the boy who cried wolf, fewer people are inclined to take them seriously when they do criticize an actual bigot or fascist. I do know that when, the f when I first heard about Richard Spencer, I felt inclined to disbelieve those who claimed he was a Nazi or a fascist and to give Richard Spencer the benefit of the doubt. Up until I did my research and found out about what his political beliefs were. Whatever the left wing does has become a drag, and fewer people are willing to take them seriously because of it. Rule number eight. Keep the pressure on. Never let up. They follow this rule extremely well, but it's at the expense of breaking the previous rule, as Esso and I have already explained. It's actually a pretty good rule, but only if you have enough self-awareness to know when it's time to stop and rethink your strategy because things aren't going your way. Rule number nine. The threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. As I've mentioned before, I think that the rules for radicals are not a productive set of ideas to abide by in order to ideologically sway your opponents, and no point better illustrates this than Rule 9. And the interesting thing is that this is a point which Marxists actually do follow remarkably well, as they regularly equate voluntary interactions with slavery and feudalism without explanation, and go on about it as if they've made valid refutations. Well, in reality, it's just fear-mongering and dishonest propaganda. But this is to their direct detriment. For one thing, because none of their arguments propose any consistent base for their claims, and if they do, the claims they make have been debunked for literally centuries and were never that solid to begin with, uh, example being the labor theory of value. This makes their lies incredibly transparent, and because humans naturally look for a more simplistic explanation as a result of cognitive bias, the majority of the population will either never become Marxist, or if they do, they will quickly become disenfranchised as a result of realizing they've been lied to, which is where the biggest issue with Rule 9 comes in. As I mentioned when discussing Rule 1, many of the people who became disenfranchised with the state have done so as a result of realizing that statism and their specific group they used to align themselves with based all of their principles and ideological concepts on inconsistencies or outright lies. Lying to people in order to sway them to your ideology does not create more support in the long term. Instead, it creates a short-term boom, but will inevitably lead to wide rejection and outright disdain among the population. As I've previously noted, Marxists don't seem to follow the rules for radicals as closely as they used to, and the few times that they do it, it appears to be mostly incidental. Rule 9 is the only rule which they consistently follow, and I believe this is only because they either don't understand or know that their own beliefs are absolute shit, and they'll never convince people by expressing their actual ideas outside of vague platitudes, rather demonizing and misrepresenting 
the ideas of their opponents to make themselves look better in comparison. But this is precisely the problem for the Marxists. Because their ideology is so garbage and has such a terrible track record, their ideological opponents don't even need to lie and misrepresent the Marxist positions because any time their ideas have ever been put into application, you get the Great Leap Forward or North Korea. So essentially, attempting to follow Rule 9 only gives the opponents of Marxism an easy opportunity to wipe the floor with them. Saul Alinsky was wrong. The thing itself can be much, much worse. And people know damned well that it is. As much as Marxists try to fearmonger about their enemies, Marxism absolutely deserves its own bad reputation. Kind of funny how they have to rely on fear-mongering about their enemies because their own ideology is infinitely worse. It's one thing to be afraid of a political movement because of what their political opponents said about it. It's quite another when that fear is grounded in reality. Rule number 10. If you push negative hard enough, it will push through and become a positive. If there is anything that SJWs have succeeded in doing, it's in turning their enemies into martyrs. It can range from punishing cake makers and photographers who don't want to provide their services for a gay marriage, or in initiating physical violence against people on the street, whether they be fascists or not, or in threatening physical violence to ensure that certain events, lectures, or speeches are cancelled. And when they do try to turn themselves into martyrs, they fail miserably simply because their opponents are incredibly keen on exposing them in the act. For instance, when Zhou Quinn tried to get people to sympathize with her, with all the crap she received, what ended up happening was that Zhou Quinn herself was exposed for being a cyberbully herself, one that had associated with Hell Dump, a trolling and doxing group that shamelessly drove people to suicide purely for the lulz. Not only was her shady history exposed, but she was also exposed for engaging in similar behavior at around the same time the Gamergate controversy broke out. To briefly summarize it, not only are leftists absolutely terrible at following Rule 10, but they consistently forget that the other side is more than capable of following this rule, and often does a better job at it than they do. You know you have it bad when people point and laugh at you when bad things happen to you despite all of your best efforts at trying to find a positive from it. You know commies have it bad when the working class openly cheers on the riot police and the military whenever they put down any communist riot or uprising. It. You know they have it bad when not even being arrested or killed by the state can turn them into martyrs. Rule number 11. The price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. The failure of the left wing to follow this rule is the root cause of their downfall. Both SJWs and Lefty Pol make half-ass efforts at following Rule 5, and they follow Rule 8 at the expense of Rule 7. However, if you're going to be a smug asshole, or if you're going to constantly accuse the other side of wrongdoing, or if you're going to constantly reel against any system whatsoever, the absolute least you can do is earn the right to do so, which means you have to be right. The burden is on you to actually be better than the side you constantly criticize or make fun of. The left is perfectly capable of carelessly throwing out accusations of bigotry or authoritarianism at their opponents. They're capable of shifting goalposts in and being disingenuous. They're capable of shitposting and, and spamming their opponents into, exha into exhaustion. They're capable of goading and irritating people, and even in bullying people on the internet, which can range from trolling, to doxing, to swatting, and even to driving people to suicide. However, there is one reason why they cannot, and will never, be able to meme. Their ideas do not resonate with most people. They have absolutely nothing better to offer than what it is they are criticizing. Nihilism, as tempting as it can be, is a self-defeating belief system. 
if you cannot offer a constructive alternative, you will lose every single time. When people are given a choice between the status quo and your ideas, they will always pick the status quo. It always takes more effort to build something up than it does to tear something down, and people understand this on a subconscious level. And I will not ever hesitate to say that I would personally rather have corporatism than socialism for this very reason. Rule number 12. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. This would actually be a good rule to follow if you didn't get caught doing it, if you get caught dehumanizing entire groups of people, or even individuals, we're more than happy to point out all the horrible things that have happened throughout history because people have forgotten that the other side were human, just like them. And then there's the obvious parallel between modern anti-Semitism and the hatred that leftists have for rich people. And it's painfully obvious when Marxists are trying to do this as well. Like, they're not even trying to be subtle about it. In fact, the entire idea of class war is based on the argument that everyone who makes their income by producing products is secretly conspiring against everyone who's a wage earner. And according to the idea of class consciousness, everyone who doesn't believe this is also conspiring with the so-called capitalist class, which is another large part of the reason why Marxists are so vitriolic towards everyone they disagree with. They literally view everyone who even slightly disagrees with them as their enemy that is directly contributing to the decline of their well-being. So, how well does the left follow Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals? When it comes to the rules they do follow, how much good does it do them? Leave a comment below.